there's something about serial killers and people who are notoriously known and famous for being evil that gives a great illustration of sin. In Romans 7.13 it says, Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. You take a Bible, you open it, and you read it every day, and the commandment, the scripture, it's going to make sin exceeding sinful to you. It's going to make it appear sin. You know, some people, they don't see sin as bad as you do. Some people, they don't uh, realize how bad their sin actually is. It's because they're not exposing themselves to the Scriptures as much. The more you expose yourself to the Scriptures and the Lord Jesus Christ, the more apparent sin is going to be. But the first thing is, sin starts out slow and progresses. In 2 Timothy 3.13 it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Your sin, it'll start out slow, and it'll get worse. Consider the serial killer known as the Golden State Killer. He started out with burglary. He started out as the Vesalia Ransacker. But, you know, he turned into the East Area Rapist. And now, he's known as the Golden State Killer. Things don't get better with time. They get worse. If they're not hooked up with God, if they're not connected with God, they run down, they get worse. You just keep pushing the envelope further and further to see what you can get away with. And it'll eventually take more and more sin to satiate the craving, to satisfy your craving. Continuing and unrepentant sin can cause you to be given over to it. In Romans 1, 26 through 28, it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. He gave them up. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Notice, gave them over. You know, you think you're in control of the sin, then the sin's in control of you, and you're given over to it. You start out with so-called little sins as a little boy or girl, but when those sins just continue and they go unchecked, it turns into a monster. And the sin's in control of you, and it's got its fingers wrapped around you. You know, you just think about it. The most evil people you know, Hitler, Manson, all those maniacs, they started out as a little baby. They had a free will, and they used the free will to make one bad choice after another, and one bad choice will most likely lead to another one, and as the years go by, you'll notice they get worse, and you get worse, and those sins and bad choices, they just build up into this evil thing. And maybe that's you. And maybe you've tried to treat your sin problem without the Lord Jesus Christ. You've tried to get 
help for this sin of yours without the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures. And that reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood. You just continue to get worse. In Mark 5, 25 through 29, it says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Notice that phrase. She grew worse. She just got worse and worse and worse. When she heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. So this woman, before she got to Jesus, she had spent all that she had. She saw many physicians, but was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. And see, these evil people, they start out so-called little sins. But they get worse and worse. Maybe they tried to get help, but it's not from the Lord Jesus Christ, so they're nothing bettered. They're just growing worse and worse. And until you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to get worse and worse. Maybe you're just... A young guy now you're you're not necessarily doing anything like a serial killer or nothing yet but maybe you're just having these wicked thoughts all the time maybe you're just you're watching pornography and things like that and that sin of pornography you just keep watching it and watching it and watching it it's going to turn into something much bigger, possibly. You may never become a serial killer, but I want to read you some stuff about serial killers and what they said about the pornography. You see, it starts out something little, but it'll get worse and worse. The serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer, speaking of his routine before hunting for a victim, said this, he said, he said, just using pictures of past victims, the pornography videos, the magazines, and whatnot, he said that's how it starts. And Jeffrey Dahmer killed 17 boys and men. He said that's how it started. Ted Bundy, a convicted rapist and murderer of Washington said that hardcore pornography had a crystallizing effect on his violent tendencies and his acting out during the 1970s. A guy, Arthur Gary Bishop from Utah, executed for raping and murdering five boys in the 1980s, said pornography had an effect effect on him that was devastating. Ed Gian, known as the Butcher of Plainfield and inspiration for movies such as Psycho and Silence of the Lambs, said that he accumulated a library of anatomy books, pornography magazines, and horror novels in the 1950s. Uh, John Wayne Gacy's wife filed for divorce in 1976 because Gacy's moods had become erratic and she had found G Gacy's por pornographic magazine collection, which was all centered around young boys. Gacy killed at least 33 young men and boys in Chicago, Illinois. The serial killer BTK was a guy by the name of Dennis Rader. And he killed 10 people. He kept meticulous records of his fantasies and crimes and what he called his mother load collection of pornography. Uh, David Berkowitz, K 
killed over a dozen people in New York. He joined a cult and was introduced to drug use, sadistic pornography, and violent crime. The cult also created and distributed child pornography. Richard Ramirez was exposed to explicit pictures of his cousin raping Vietnamese women and serving the heads of Vietnam soldiers. And he in turn killed at least 13 people in California. Edmund Kemper, a California serial killer and necrophile known as the co-ed killer, used pornography and magazines for erotic stimulation. He picked up women who were hitchhiking, then killed and raped them. So you see, all these serial killers connection with pornography. In 2013, on the day that a guy named Mark Bridger, a UK native, abducted April Jones, he viewed online photographs of a young girl and a pornographic cartoon depicting rape. So you see how sin, it may start out slow, just looking at something, just thinking about something. But it turns into something much bigger. And see, you're sick with sin. The only way out is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross, shedding his blood for your sins. He was buried, proven that he really died. And he rose again, proving that he is God. To be saved and to have your sins taken away, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross to be your payment for sin. You have to get saved to get victory over sin. Now, I'm not saying you'll quit sinning after you're saved, but I'm saying the only way that you're ever going to get help and get any type of victory over it is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're just going to grow worse and worse if you don't. And you're going to find yourself nothing bettered. And after you get saved, it will be a process. But with Jesus Christ, you can grow better and better instead of getting worse and worse. It can be a process of getting better. Until one day you reach the rapture where you get a new body. That won't sin anymore. And you know you can cover it up for a while. The thing about sin is you can cover it up for a while. The serial killer BTK was a family man. He had a wife for over 30 years. He had kids. He was a Cub Scout leader. He was a member of Christ Lutheran Church for 30 years. Went to church dinners where he brought food and was president of a council at his church. All the while, he's a serial killer on the side. The Golden State Killer was a police officer for three years, a veteran. He had a family. He worked a job. John Wayne Gacy was a clown, did um, parties as a clown. You know, how much more of a disguise do you need or if you're scared of clowns, you know, you might say, well, this is a horrible disguise. But the clown tricks with handcuffs helped him get some of his victims. Now, what does this remind you of? It reminds me of 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, where it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He doesn't want sin to appear sin. He doesn't want you to see him as something bad or sinful. He wants to deceive you. The devil is appearing as something good outwardly. But one day they will look on him and see him for how vile he really is. You know, maybe you have a family, a respectable job, a nice suit, a nice car, and everyone thinks that you're just this great member of society 
but you have all these skeletons inside your closet. And maybe you will keep it hidden for the rest of your life, but then when you die, your kids open up that closet and get buried in all the skeletons. In Proverbs 28, 13, it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You know, Gacy had the bodies buried under his house and everything else. He was trying to cover it up. He didn't want nobody to know. And that's you and your secret sin. You got them buried. And you're not going to prosper. You know, Achan tried to hide his sin in the dirt under his tent, remember? Over in Joshua chapter 7. He didn't prosper. He didn't want to confess it and forsake it. You see, you need to come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner... And get your sins under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ instead of under the ground or under your mattress or under your whatever it is you're hiding it under. You need to get it under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've already done that. Maybe you are saved, but you're still stacking skeletons in your closet with a clown suit on trying to cover it up. Here's what you do. If you're already saved and you want to get right in your walk with God, simply come to the Lord right now and confess and forsake your sin. And you just pray for mercy. First John 1 John 1.9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Examine your life. Look in your closet. Do you have any skeletons falling out? Do you have some skeletons under your house that you're trying to hide? It says in 1 Corinthians 11.31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Some people, they have such a disguise, and they have it covered up so well, they're in denial themselves about who they really are. They're denying themselves about all this sin that they got going on. And I'm not saying to go out and air out all your dirty laundry to, to people. I'm not saying to go confess your sin to some priest somewhere. I'm saying get saved if you're lost. And if you already are saved, then confess your sins to God and forsake the secret sin. Because another thing about sin is your sin affects others. It affects everybody around you. You know... Uh, these serial killers who, you know, they lived a normal life for 30 years. They had people in their normal life that relied on them, looked up to them, cared for them. Maybe a, a daughter, a son, a mother, whoever it may have been. And then when those skeletons start falling out of that closet, what do you think it does to those people in their normal life? Your sin affects others. Uh, there's a guy named Chris Watts that started out having an affair. Actually, probably didn't start out with an affair. It started out with wicked thoughts. You know, you don't just have an affair without having wicked thoughts first about having the affair. So it would have started out with that, but then he had an affair. And he was already married with children and it ends with him murdering his wife and children because he thinks that's the only way he can be with this woman he's having an affair with. You see how his sin affected his family. Even if they don't even know you're doing it. And Romans fourteen seven says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Your sin affects everybody around you. It doesn't just affect you. You know, there's famous catchphrases. People say, I'm not hurting anybody but me. Or, a little bit won't hurt. Or, my sin's not hurting anybody else. You, but your sin always affects others. It affects everybody around you. 
you know, however you live is going to affect your kids. And, you know, be sure your sin will find you out. In Numbers 32, 23, that's what it says. Be sure your sin will find you out. Sin caught up to the Golden State Killer. You know, he was getting it. He was killing through the 70s and the 80s. And just seems like he stopped for a while. And most likely he thought, I'm getting away with it. He was already about 70-something years old. But be sure your sin will find you out. They finally got him. Sin caught up to the Golden State Killer because of DNA. And the genealogy database type things. That's how they found him. His name is Joseph D'Angelo. And he became the first public arrest obtained through genetic genealogy, a new technique that takes the DNA of an unknown suspect, like the Golden State Killer, the DNA left behind at a crime scene. It takes that DNA and identifies him by tracing a family tree through his or her family members who voluntarily submitted their DNA to public genealogy databases and I believe it was a, d a daughter or niece or something of his of the killer she had submitted her DNA to these public genealogy databases and they just they ran the killer's DNA through there to see if there was a match and there was a match and they found out who the Golden State Killer was through this new technique be sure your sin will find you out. You know, he'd been getting away with it for 30, 40 years. Almost probably dead himself. He's already 70-something years old. But he got caught. You know, you may get by with it for the rest of your life. But be sure your sin will find you out. His DNA was his downfall. And if you haven't been regenerated, that's going to be your downfall. You need to be born again. Have you been regenerated? Have you been born again? 1 Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Titus 3.5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. And renewing of the Holy Ghost. You need to be born again. Or your DNA is going to give you away. You're going to stand before God Almighty at the great white throne judgment. Unregenerated. And your DNA is going to give you away. Right now, if you're not saved, you're a child of the devil. When you get born again... You get put into the family of God. You become a child of God. You get born again. You know, you can go for a long time, but you'll eventually, you're going to eventually get caught. Maybe in a way you never imagined. Maybe in a way that they haven't even invented yet. But God will allow your sins to come out. He knows the deep and secret things. He knows what's done in the darkness. You know, there's there's not one idle word that's not going to be uncovered. You can't play games with sin like people do. You know, that BTK serial killer, he kept playing cat and mouse games with the police. He was sending them notes on floppy disks that he was riding in his church. You know, that's how he got caught. You know, he was killing for a while. I believe it was in the 80s and maybe early 90s. And he just stopped all of a sudden. Um, maybe it was... He was getting up in age. A little, maybe it was a little harder for him to, to actually go kill and not get caught. But he was able to just stop killing. 
And then one day he's watching the news and he sees that BTK must be dead. They're saying, well, BTK's dead. He's not been killing in a while. And so his pride sets in and he starts sending these um, uh, floppy disks to the police with pictures of the killings that only the killer would have. And he just starts playing cat and mouse games with them, and that's how he gets caught. You know, they get some computer guy that was able to tell where those floppy disks came from and everything else. And I believe it said the name of his church on there. And that's how they found out who he was. You know, he was just playing games with sin. There was no remorse there. After all those years, he hadn't been feeling guilty or are bad about the victims and what he had done. And Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God is not mocked. You know, you, you better quit trying to mock God. You better be, quit trying to just play games with sin and with God and confess and forsake the sin. When you are so unrepentant and your conscience is so seared, you get cocky in your sin and you're just playing games with it. You think, well, I'm never going to get caught. You know, the Zodiac Killer would send letters to the newspapers about his crimes. And as far as I know, he never got caught down here. But wait until the judgment. You know, the dating game killer was going on dating shows dating game shows while people was looking for him because of his crimes. He was a wanted man, but he was playing games with sin, going on game shows and winning them. All the while, he's a killer. You see, people get so cocky and so caught up in their sin that they don't believe they're going to get caught. They believe that they're above any type of uh, consequences. Sin and darkness are connected. You know, it says in John 3, 20, John 3, 19 and 20, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. You know, most of the bad stuff that goes on is taking place in the dark at night. I believe the Golden State Killer, another one of his names is the original Night Stalker. And one of his catchphrases was, I'll be gone in the dark. And he would wait till nighttime and he would uh, run around at night behind fences and in the bushes, and use the night itself to intimidate people and scare people. Men love darkness rather than light. He would come into the room with the flashlight and shine it on people in the dark. And then you got the night stalker, Richard Ramirez, doing his killings in the dark. Sin and darkness are connected. And men love darkness rather than light. Sin ruins your conscience. Jeffrey Dahmer said, I've always wondered myself why I don't feel more remorse. Bundy said, what is one less person on the face of the earth anyway? He said that about you know, his killings. Their conscience would get seared. You start getting more and more comfortable with your sin to where it doesn't even bother you anymore. You just get comfortable in your own filth. In 1 Timothy 4.2, it says, Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In Titus 1.15, it says, Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. 
sin looks worse to certain people who are looking at it through the scriptures compared to those who never look at it through the scriptures. And you take somebody that's not exposed to any scriptures, not exposed to any Bible preaching, not exposed to any light of the Word of God, and anything's going to go. It's going to be like in the book of Judges where every man was doing what's right in his own eyes. And their sin affects the masses. You know, like I said, your sin affects others. You know, now you hear more about mass shooters than you do serial killers. Just like in 2017, Las Vegas, 60 were killed. That's 60 funerals. Those 60 people would have went on to have children or had children already. You know, that affects massive amounts of people. Look at how many people was affected by those moments of of shooting. You know, you think about abortionists. There was one abortionist who has performed 50,000 abortions. 50,000. Imagine if the victims of serial killers and abortionists were able to go on and live their lives. You know, 50,000 babies were killed by one man. That's 50,000 people that would have grown up and had children, and then their children would have had children, and then their children have children, and then their children have children. That amounts to a massive amount of people over time. And one guy killed 50,000 babies. That's an intense amount. That changed, if you think about it, that changed the future. It affected a massive amount of people because, I mean, 50,000 people just being not living their life out affected the future greatly. You know, imagine if uh, you were aborted. You would have never met your wife. Your wife would have never met you. You would have never had your kids. And the people you've interacted with, maybe you got best friends, they wouldn't have you wouldn't have been their best friend. Somebody else would have been their best friend. You know, just one person not being there affects many people. What about fifty thousand people? You know, that this illustrates to what I'm trying to illustrate to you is this sin affects the masses. Your sin and lifestyle affects your kid and it molds them. And then their lifestyle molds their kids. And then your grandkids' lifestyle molds their kids. And so on and so forth. How you live affects a massive amount of people. You know, my great, 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 great grandfather some stuff that he did or said, even though I don't realize it or know it or even know him, it's affected me. You know, sin brings temporary and disgraceful trophies. There's a guy named Kermit Gosnell. He was a... An, a a former physician, abortionist, and serial killer. And he provided illegal late-term abortions at his clinic in West Philadelphia. And Gosnell was convicted of the murders of three infants who were born alive after using drugs to induce labor. He was convicted of the manslaughter of one woman during an ab abortion procedure and of several other abortion and drug-related crimes. And staff at Gosnell's clinic testified that there were hundreds of infants born alive during abortion procedures and subsequently killed by Gosnell. And he, he was killing hundreds of infants born alive. And, you know, this... The abortion stuff, it's 
killing and they're getting money for it. You know, sin will bring temporary rewards and pleasures and trophies for a while. But the pleasures of sin only last for a season. The things you'll be proud of are the things that are killing you if you're proud of your sin. You know, a lot of serial killers, they'll take trophies of their crimes and killing sprees. They might take a bone or a body part or jewelry or a person's clothes. This way they can go back and relive the moment again. And a sign that you don't have the remorse that you should is the fact that you treasure the sin that you're in. You know, there was a guy that was doing abortions and he was taking pieces of the body parts of the baby he was killing and he was taking them to his home. He had like, when he died, he had like hundreds and hundreds of, of body parts. But maybe you're just in what people would call a so-called little sin right now. But it's going to grow worse and worse. The thing you need to do is admit your sin and don't try to represent yourself. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You can't represent yourself. You're guilty. You're going to stand before God Almighty one day, and you can't represent yourself. You have to have an advocate. Jesus Christ. You know, the serial killer Ted Bundy decided to represent himself during his trial in June 1979 for the murders of two college girls who he had, who he had murdered, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death by an electric chair. You're trying to represent yourself, possibly. You got your own self-righteousness, and you think you can present this to God and say, I may have done these things, but I was this or this or that. But if you don't have Jesus Christ as your advocate, you're going to be found guilty. If you don't have his righteousness imputed to your permanent record, you're going to be sentenced to eternal death in the lake of fire. Romans 3.19 says, All the world is guilty before God. It says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. In James 2.10 it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. You're guilty. You have to admit it. You're a sinner. You've done horrible things. And if you're not saved, you're going to go to hell. And you're going to spend eternity in hell. But there is a way out. You come to the Lord Jesus Christ, who lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for your sins, shedding his blood. He was buried and resurrected. When he was on the cross, he died for each and every sin that you've ever committed, even the ones you think that there's no way you could get forgiveness for. He died for those too. He died for every one. So your sin's already been paid for. You just have to accept the payment. And the way to accept the payment, you just come to him as the guilty sinner that you are, like the night I got saved, I said, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. But I know you died on the cross for me. And I said, save me. I'm relying on you to be my payment for sin. And I've been saved ever since. Just like the Bible says, Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All you need to know is that you're a sinner and that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for those sins. And you accept him and what he did on the cross as your payment for sin. That's, that's all you do. That's how you get saved. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now if you are saved, but like I said, you're still stacking all these skeletons in your closet. You're going to, you just... 
your sin's already forgiven when it comes to eternity, when it comes to salvation. You're saved, so your sin's already forgiven in that sense. But when it comes to your daily walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, your walk is not good because you're still stacking up all these sins and your sins are just going to bring you to an early grave. What you need to do is you need to pray for remorse if you're not if you're not feeling bad about it at all. Maybe you've seared your conscience and you need to pray for that conscience to come back. And the fact that you're feeling bad enough about it to pray for your conscience to not be seared anymore, that's a good sign that there's still some, there's still a repentant heart left in there. But it says in 1 John 1, 7 through 10, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. It cleanses you from your sin when it comes to salvation and eternity, but it also cleanses you of sin and your daily walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, that If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So you got all these skeletons in your closet. You're a saved person and you got all these skeletons in your closet. You need to come to the Lord right now and confess the sins and he'll wipe the slate clean and there won't be nothing in your closet no more. You confess your sins and forsake them. Now, I'm not saying you uh, won't uh, reap the consequences of those sins in the flesh anymore. Most likely you will, but you'll have those skeletons out of the closet and nothing between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. But I hope I've made you realize that sin is a deceptive thing. Sin is an ugly thing. Sin brings death. Sin hurts everybody around you. And be sure your sin will find you out. You are going to get caught. The best thing to do is come to the Lord Jesus Christ now. Get forgiveness for those sins. And... Pray for mercy.